Thank you for tuning in to Finish the Fight, a gaming podcast. If you have not, be sure to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash finish the fight, where we have some amazing merch and plenty of other things for you guys. If you're an athlete, you know the greatest motivator of all is the fear of letting your teammates down. After all, a team is only as good as its weakest link. So you owe it to those wearing the same jersey as you to be your best every time you step on the field. That's why there's no vape in team. When you vape, you can expose your lungs to toxic chemicals that can damage your lungs. If you're a step behind, the team's a step behind. Brought to you by The Real Cost and the FDA. Welcome back to Finish the Fight, a gaming podcast. Where we produce and develop the highest quality gaming research in podcast form. I am your host, Alex Kendall. And I am your host, Derek Baker. And today, we're simplifying life just a little bit. We're getting out of the cubicle, shredding that Amazon-esque job, and just living the simple life on a farm. And what a farm it is. You have so many different options. If your farm is on just a farm. You can do that. If you want your farm to be in a forest, you can make your farm in a forest. You can do all kinds of different farm life activities and a lot more than that. You can mine, fish, even find love. Oh. All the way out in Stardew Valley. What do you think about Stardew Valley, Alex? Is this a good game? Do you like this game? Stardew Valley is a fantastic title that if you have not checked it out yet, I highly recommend, if you just happen to be listening to this episode and you have not played it, please go do. But for all of you who have played it, you know what kind of quality this game is. It itched that scratch that people had for Harvest Moon for having like another life simulator that was extremely fun, fun pixel art, and really brought a lot of people together on pretty much every system. This game for me was a great relaxation tool. If there was just a winding down game, if you're looking for that, Stardew Valley is the one. I feel like at this point in life, I'm looking for that more often than not, being able to mm-hmm. just kind of chill, lay back, not worry about completing a specific task or fighting an intense boss, you know, just plant a few things in the ground, get a little mechanical and technical and sort of robotic in a way where you're not having to think as much. You're not having to strategize or react. You're just going one by one on a grid and and doing what you can to have a successful farm. So it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it's very much on that simulator of Minecraft or Terraria where you can take a lot more time just to kind of relax and chill. There are ups and downs in all these games that might be a little crazy, Uh, but for the most part, It just invites you in to have some fun. So Stardew Valley is a simulation role-playing game developed by Eric Concerned Ape Barone. It was initially released for Microsoft Windows in February 2016 before being ported to several other computer, console, and mobile platforms. Players take the role of a character who takes over their deceased grandfather's dilapidated farm in a place known as Stardew Valley. The game is open-ended allowing players to take on activities such as growing crops, raising livestock, mining and foraging, selling produce, and socializing with the townspeople, including the ability to marry and have children. It also allows up to three other players to play together online. Barone developed Stardew Valley by himself over four years. He was heavily inspired by the Harvest Moon video game series with additions to address some of the shortcomings of those games. He used it as an exercise to improve his own programming and gaming design skills. British studio Chucklefish approached Barone midway through development with the offer to publish the game, allowing him to focus more on completing it. Stardew Valley was a critical and commercial success, selling over 15 million copies by 2021. Critics highlighted the game's music, characters, and relaxing qualities. Barone's decision to include same-sex relationships was also praised. Yashihiro Wada, the creator of Harvest Moon, praised the game for retaining the freedom that later entries of his series had lost. Stardew Valley was created by American indie game designer Eric Barone, as we said, under the alias of Concerned Ape. 
In 2011, Barona graduated from the University of Washington Tacoma with a computer science degree, but had not been able to get a job in the industry, instead working as an usher at the Paramount Theater in Seattle. Looking to improve his computer skills for better job prospects, he came to the idea of crafting a game which would also pull in his artistic side. Growing up in the Pacific Northwest, Barone incorporated many elements of the region into the gameplay and art. Stardew Valley originally began as a modern fan-made alternative to the Harvest Moon series, as he felt the series had gotten progressively worse after Harvest Moon Back to Nature. Unable to find a satisfactory replacement, Barone began to create a game similar to the series, stating that his intent was to address the problems that he had with Harvest Moon and that no title in the series ever brought it all together in a perfect way. Barone was also inspired by other games, including Animal Crossing, Rune Factory, Minecraft, and Terraria, adding features seen in those games such as crafting, quests, and combat. And you can definitely see a lot of that impact from those games within Stardew Valley. There's just so many little bits and pieces that you can pull from these modern games that, again, if you have not played a Harvest Moon title, it's very much like Stardew Valley. You jump into a farm, you have a set day to do certain things in town or in the mine or take care of livestock. So it's taking that idea and reverting it back to the original, which I I think was an N64, maybe a Super Nintendo title. Um, But I know one of the first ones was back there. Then later editions came out trying to add in more modern game mechanics, just extra things to do, quests, all this other stuff. And it just, I think, got bloated. And I think that's where Stardew Valley can step in, where it is a much simpler title on the surface, I will say. And then as you start to build into the game, building those relationships, exploring the town and the surrounding area, it adds so much more. Yeah, it was originally a Super Nintendo game. Okay. And obviously, like, people that love the Harvest Moon series really love the Harvest Moon series. I never really played those games. I did play Animal Crossing, so that was sort of my connection to a game like this. And Mm -hmm. there are a lot of similarities, especially with the developing relationships with certain characters, friendships, and, and things like that. So. It does uh, a good job of, I think, creating a connectivity and like a ownership, I guess, of your farm within a town environment. Um, And sometimes those games, it's hard to actually make them feel that way. They there are plenty Mm -hmm. of games out there that try and utilize like a relationship mechanic, but not that many of them do it as well as Stardew Valley. Totally agree. So. Initially, Barone considered releasing the title on Xbox Live Indie Games due to the ease of publishing on that platform, but found early on that his scope for the game became much larger than originally anticipated. Barone publicly announced the game in September 2012, using Steam's green light system to gauge interest on the game. After the title was shown a great deal of support from the community, Barone began working on the title in full engaging with Reddit and Twitter communities to discuss his progress and gain feedback on proposed additions. Shortly after the green light period in 2013, he was approached by Finn Bryce, director of Trucklefish, who offered to help publish the game on release. Trucklefish took over many of the non-development activities for Barone, such as site hosting and setting up his development wiki. Barone decided not to use Steam's early access feature for development, as he felt that it was not well suited to Stardew Valley, which makes sense. You don't necessarily want someone jumping in to just like plant crops for one season and they're done or like see all these bugs that it's not a game that lends to that. It's more of like, Hey, this is what I'm working on. You guys like it. You think it's going to be cool. And much more that that side of it versus like a modern, let's say shooter or like phasmophobia, which is continually to update and has a, somewhat finished game because you can play rounds versus like a whole title. Barone spent four years working on the project, redoing it multiple times, and was the sole developer on the game, frequently spending 10 hours or more a day working on it. He originally programmed it in C Sharp using the Microsoft XNA framework, but later migrated to Mono Game in 2021, which, according to Barone, quote, future-proofs the game and allows mods to access more than 4 gigs of RAM. 
He also created all the game's pixel art and composed all the music for the one man band slash hand slash dandy guy. <laughs> yeah, it's take crazy. it away now, Derek. It, I have embarrassed myself enough. <laughs> it is uh it's crazy just how much work he did for this game yeah. all by himself. It really is special. Barone aimed to give players the feeling of immersion in a small farming community, stating that he wanted Stardew Valley to be entertaining while also designing it to have real-world messages. In contrast to earlier Harvest Moon games, which could end after two years of in-game time has passed, Barone kept Stardew Valley open-ended so that players would not feel rushed to try to complete everything possible. During development, Barone recognized that some players would attempt to figure out mechanically how to maximize their farm's yield and profit through spreadsheets and other tools, but hoped that most players would just take their time to learn these on their own. To that end, he designed the cooking aspect of the game purposely not to be profitable, but instead to pay back in bonuses that aided exploration, farming, mining, and fishing skills. Brone also opted not to include the butchering of farm animals for meat products, encouraging players to name and tend to each animal individually and staying with the feeling he wanted for the game. The animals cannot die but stop producing products if not tended to. So there's a little bit of humanity there and a little bit of like, yeah, we 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 don't want to have a sim situation, right, where you can lock all your animals in a barn and the barn catches fire and you watch them all die, something like that. The same way that people might have done that in their kitchen in the Sims game where mm-hmm. there's a there's sort of a disconnection there. They he wanted people to feel like there was at least something within the game that I think connects the player to the farm and the animals and punishes you for being a bad farm owner or a bad pet owner. And I think that that's a good decision because you don't want this game to be all about maximizing profits. There are a lot of games out there that you're almost punished early on if you're not 100% efficient to start the game. And I have a bad tendency myself of going into those games sort of like, oh, well, I haven't learned yet what I'm supposed to be doing. Now that I know, I wish I had started the game differently. Let me start over. And this game, I think, is a little bit more forgiving in those aspects where you start to learn, but it, it doesn't totally kill your game if you mess up at the beginning, which I think Mm -hmm. is important for a game like this. It's so interesting too. I'm going to bring this up real quick as we switched over to marketing. So in a Forbes article I was reading, uh, the, the author was talking about how his daughter was actually playing Stardew. Like he really knew nothing about it. Wasn't really into video games and was watching his young daughter. I think she was seven or so. Um, He was just saying like how she mismanaged the farm, planted a plant over here in this asymmetrical pattern, neglected some things. And so he's like, he figured it was was multiplayer, joined her and he did the spreadsheeting. He's like maximizing on melon production and peas and knowing when to sell and like when to do these things. And he's talking to his daughter to try and do that. And she stops him when he shows her like, hey, look, if you sell all this, we can make a bunch of money. She goes, okay but who loves you? (laughs) And like for him that clicked on like, you know what? I have not paid attention to the town. I don't know the townspeople. I didn't do that. And so when he looked over at her screen, you know, she had hearts for almost everyone. She was getting these gifts. And so it goes to show you like you can, if you want to be that kind of maximizing profit spreadsheet at each season, you know, peak as much as you can, but there's so much more involved into it of like meeting the townsfolk whether forming a relationship or not, but, you know, doing that, mining, fishing, there's just so much to it. And it's so cool to see that you can kind of find your own way in it. To well, make it and that's sort of the lesson of the game, right? That, and it, it points mm-hmm. you in that direction to start with because you're working uh, for a corporation at the beginning. And you're like, no, this isn't really for me. And your grandfather has given you this place that if you want to go and get away and you're tired of just the nine to five grind, you can go and do that. And so to do that, then immediately work within this hyper efficiency corporate type of structure to your farm is very much what the game's purpose 
uh, it's like it, the, uh, the exact opposite. You, you were not supposed to go to this farm and just work the farm to death. And, mm-hmm. you know, it does have to be a little bit of a part of life, right? To make the, to get money somehow, whether that be through fishing or whatever it is that you end up deciding to do, there is like that money and, and lifestyle choice, but it's definitely not the only thing. And you miss out on mm-hmm. so much if you decide to not go into the town and participate in the, the holidays and things like that. So, that, I mean, that's a great story. That's exactly it, too, is because, you know, the holidays are a big thing. But if you don't explore those relationships with people, you actually miss, like, cutscenes. You actually miss these little moments that happen between characters, or between your character and one of the characters of the town that does have that real feel. You have, you know, a man who is handicapped in a wheelchair. You have a guy who's homeless. You have a woman who's addicted to alcohol, and you experience their stories and these real-life kind of things that break them down from just being these pixel art caricatures of people into, like, actually forming this, like, oh, I do feel really bad for that grumpy guy now. Like, he's not just mean. He has a reason why these things happen. And it it begs you to explore that and understand it. Well, and it... This is one thing that it does probably better than Animal Crossing, and that Animal Crossing, sometimes you run into characters and they're just sort of having a bad day. Mm -hmm. And it's very random, and it's just like, I'm just not having a great day. Where Concerned Ape programmed these characters to have routines and be consistent and different within different times of the year. Yes, And on top of that, to be able to get to know them better and they share more details of their life with you. Whereas in like an Animal Crossing game, yeah, there are certain aspects of that as well, but it's a little bit more of a one-off. Yeah. Where you might you might feel closer to one of those animal characters. But they don't necessarily treat you a, a ton differently. They do a little bit, but not to the level that the Stardew Valley characters do. No, especially with Animal Crossing. It's, you know, a randomly generated thing that might happen, whether two animals get into a tough or a fight, whether someone, like you said, is having a really great day or is sick or so many other elements that can occur. And this really is just excellent storytelling wrapped up in a simple pixel game. You know, it's these NPCs. It's what a lot of like Dungeon Masters and Dungeons and Dragons dream of to have is these like random NPC stories that unfold over time for the player that actually causes a reaction to it. Yeah. You do feel bad or you feel glad for people or you feel this. And there's a lot of games where either people just fall into tropes and you know exactly how things are going to pan out or it's just, Oh, they died in that. Okay. Like (laughs) I had no bearing on them even being here. It didn't make me feel anything for them. So why should I care? And I think that's what he's done with this is made you care. Especially because there are just certain characters that are very standoffish or uptight Mm -hmm. to begin with. And then once you start to figure them out a little bit, they start opening up more and more. And eventually, you know, they can become your spouse. Uh, You can you can start from a very standoffish thing and then eventually live with them, which is. Very different from like an Animal Crossing game, of course, because as far as I know, you cannot get married in those games or you can have like best friends and things like that. But it's it's a very different, more intimate level of friendship within Stardew Valley. Yeah, I would say even comparing it to The Sims, which is probably the closest you would get with that as like forming a relationship. It's different. The Sims has its own thing and you can kind of really like your Sim or what's going on. but One, actually having language. (laughs) And two, (laughs) getting a backstory for each of them that's not just, oh, I know what their perks are and their quirks. Yeah. Let me go ahead and play up to those things. Well, that one is definitely a very mechanical relationship game where it's just, you know, you say the right things, give them compliments, 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 compliments. Now we're at a level 100 friend rating. Mm Mm-hmm. The situation's right, you kiss them, you give them a ring, now you're married. You know. Yep. This this shares yep. a little bit of that, but it's not quite the same. It has to be the right gifts. It has to be mm-hmm. at a certain time and a certain relationship level. And 
it's more complex and realistic in that sense. And one of the biggest things I know Barone has like talked about with it as well is having Reddit, having Twitter communities be able to give feedback on a lot of things. Um, it's because if we jump to marketing for it, there wasn't any. It's an indie title. It's a single person indie title. So the marketing is just his word of mouth on these sites. You know, he again went to the moniker Concerned Ape for all of these and would share builds ask people what they're thinking, what do they think of this? You know, just being a guy out of, you know, the Pacific Northwest, he's like, I I know what I know. What do the rest of you know about these type of things? What do you like to see? And so yeah, he turned to Reddit and turned to Twitter for questions and giving updates and plenty of other things. And then another thing he did that he's continuing with his new title as well is working with his game's website and the blog where he'll add in plenty of different details of what's going to happen with updates, what's happening with characters, especially in the first builds. And then after the game releases, doing those updates on there, letting them know what's going happening. And even early on, letting a few fans test a couple beta builds, which people loved and just kept building that. And another thing that helped as far as marketing, again, not too much, was Chucklefish would do hour-long streams of Stardew on those very early years of Twitch, putting it out there for fans to watch, doing different multiplayer things, single-player editions of it, and just seeing the people, seeing the different build states of it. So not your typical toga party with Bill Gates. Oh, man, with lions and stuff. <laughs> no lions and tigers. What an episode oh throwback. <laughs> but was that age of showing, civilization it was got, got some uh, civilization action right there yeah uh but age of empire one of the biggest that's what it was uh, Sorry. age age of empire stuff right there that's <laughs> what i'm talking about um but it shows you one getting lucky but two putting that effort in showing it off to people who then show it off to other people who then show it off to this and then having a publishing team that is full support of you doing this, it works. And listening to your community, it works. Well, and the amount of hours that he put in, I, I know that he has said that he spent probably like 60 to 80 hours a week, you know, programming mm -hmm. this game and still continues to push out a lot of updates, like we'll talk about a little bit more. But he obviously cared a lot about this game and was willing to listen to feedback. And that's something that we don't see from a lot of publishers now because it's more about the surprise. It's more about getting the game out there and trying to keep it all a secret so they can wow you the first playthrough. But a game like this, where it's more about building relationships and more about a long-term play, mm -hmm. you know, it's a smart way to go about it where you just get continuous feedback and you're willing to give continuous updates to make those things a reality yep obviously passion for games results in a good product 99 percent of the time absolutely so on top of that there was a cooperative board game adaptation for stardew valley it's called stardew valley the board game and it was released in february of 2021 so just a year ago the game description goes in depth and tells the players to quote work together with your fellow farmers to save the valley from the nefarious Joja Corporation. In order to do this, you'll need to farm, fish, friend, and find all kinds of different resources to fulfill Grandpa's goals and restore the community center. Collect all kinds of items, raise animals, and explore the mine. Gain powerful upgrades and skills, and as the seasons pass, do your best to protect the magic of Stardew Valley. However popular the video game was, the Stardew Valley website shop warns it's really important to us that as a buyer you understand Stardew Valley, the board game, is not a quick, casual game. While it is easy to play once you know the rules, it's meant to be challenging. We wanted an experience with depth and replayability. If your game group or family prefers short play times, something like less than 45 minutes, with a small number of rules and components, this game might not be a good fit. Overall, the game has received good reviews with a 7.1 out of 10 average on BoardGameGeek.com. Have you played this game, Alex? I have not yet. I had seen some of the stuff about it. Um, it's Again, it's kind of that scary thing of 
finding a dedicated group that would spend hours on this. And and I am glad that on the website they put that to know like if you're trying to buy this for your seven year old because they play it. It's like listen, this is not like a seek and find or match the picture games. This is a like a very in depth game that follows a lot of the video game mechanics that involves co op, that involves you getting luck on the draws, that involves going through different seasons and eras. So it's it's definitely an interesting one if you like Stardew. From the reviews I read and a couple of the YouTube videos I watched just on some of the rule bases, people who like it really like it. What I'm most interested about with this is maybe what it offers that differentiates itself from the video game. I have not played this Mm -hmm. board game either, but now that Stardew Valley has the cooperative play, is there an added benefit to playing this in a board game version? Mm -hmm versus the video game version and it, it does it just ultimately come down to preference for i'd rather have that real life real world interaction instead of doing it through video games or whatever i think it's i think it's a lot of that now i did know from doing a little bit of research that this did sell out several times it is back up on the stardew valley store uh, i believe it was 55 dollars u.s but when I was looking on eBay and a couple of other resellers, I mean, you're looking two to three hundred. Yeah, it's fifty five. This I'm this, actually looking at it right yeah, now. Yeah, before this jumped back up, it was pr- before they got it back in stock. I should say uh, the prices were super high in aftermarket for it because I know that was a, a pretty big seller early 2021. Uh, but you can, as of early 2022, purchase it from their shop. Yeah, I mean, it it looks to be available right now. So. If you're listening to this episode and you're a board game player instead of a video game player, I'm not sure why you'd be listening to this podcast, but it is available (laughs) to you if that's something that you want to do. Personally, um, I might pick up the Stardew Valley digital version, play that a little bit more before I hopped into something like this myself. But Who knows? But you know what, Derek? That's a great jumping off point that I'll point out exactly to the audience so they know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> we're talking about gameplay now. <laughs> Let's I'm do be it. very apparent on how we switch. <laughs> Let's do it. That is a smooth transition so, right there, baby. Oh, it was probably, probably the best we've ever had. So Stardew Valley, as I have said, is a farming simulation game primarily inspired by the Harvest Moon video game series. At the start of the game, players create a character who becomes the recipient of a plot of land and a small house once owned by their grandfather in a small town called Pelican Town. Players may select from several different farm types, each with a unique theme and different benefits and drawbacks. Very much like what Derek said, a farm farm, a forest farm, a beach farm, a river farm, haunted farm, very different variations, very variations, as some might say. Ooh, it's <laughs> that, very varied. To start it off, very varied. To start it off, whether you want more of a farm experience or like the haunted one, it has combat on your farm. So you'd constantly have to be fighting stuff as you go. So there's different ways to start it. The farmland is initially overrun with boulders, trees, stumps, and weeds, and players must work to clear them to restart the farm, tending to crops and livestock to generate revenue and further expand the farm's buildings and facilities. Do you have a favorite starting point for this game? Um, I, so they had, there was a newer update in 2021 that added the beach, yeah. which was actually really fun if you like fishing and doing like crab pots and stuff. Yeah. So that was an interesting one because I don't like doing a huge expansive farm. I like a little contained crop space and the rest is just fun, usable things. Yeah. I pretty much do the same thing, but I I do it in the forest area. For whatever mm -hmm. reason, that one always felt the most mystical to me whenever I'd start. I, I did try doing the normal farm thing, but I felt like isolated farm in the middle of the woods was really cool. There's not a lot of room to plant stuff. Um, but there's a lot of resources and stuff there. Yes, exactly. Adding to the pluses and the minuses for each start area. And there's plenty of Stardew Valley mods out there that can change your starting area. There's one that adds a small little mining thing. I don't know if it's every day, but there'll be certain rocks that just pop up. So you mm. get some copper, some iron, some gold that might pop up there. So you don't necessarily have to go to the mine that day, but you can still get some resources that you otherwise wouldn't get. Players may also interact with non-player characters or NPCs that inhabit the town, including engaging in relationships with them, and this can culminate in marriage, which results in the NPC helping the player's character to tend the farm. 
Players can also engage in fishing, cooking, crafting, and exploring procedurally generated caves with materials and ores to mine or creatures to combat. Players can take on various quests to earn additional money or complete specific collections of materials called bundles to restore the town's community center or pay certain amounts of money to complete Jojamart bundles. You would have to be totally heartless, I think, to go with the Jojamart path, but maybe our friend from Forbes, maybe that's <laughs> more his style. Maybe it is. Completing bundles rewards players with various items, including seeds and tools. And completing multiple bundles grants players access to new areas and game mechanics such as the desert. All of these activities must be metered against the character's current health and exhaustion level and the game's internal clock. The player can consume food that grants certain buffs that are useful in certain activities and situations. Food is also a source of replenishing health and energy, which allows the player to complete more tasks in a given day. The game uses a simplified calendar each year having four 28-day months that represent each season, and this determines which crops can be grown and which activities can be beneficial. Later in the game, players can restore a greenhouse and an island that can grow any crop regardless of the season. So yeah, once you get to that late game, because again, it's one of those games that's very simple. Do the farm, build your spring things, do this, go to this festival. Then as you complete those bundles, it just adds more and more and more to do and gives you that late game quality of like, ah, listen, I don't want to to December to do this or spring to do this. I'm going to do it now on you know the island of the greenhouse. And it just allows for so much more to keep building into the game. And this is where Stardew Valley, again, contrasts with Animal Crossing because Animal Crossing has a similar setup where there are certain days set up to celebrate a holiday or an event, Mm -hmm. and you have to actually be playing on that real-life day. Whereas in Stardew Valley, those things still exist, but because it's not tied to a real-life clock, if you miss it the first time through, you can just keep playing a little bit more and get to the next year or the next season, depending on what the event is, and then try it again. Or sometimes just repeat something that you've already done. And you don't have to do those things, but having those options available rather than like having to change your system's clock or something like that to to turn back time or go forward in time just to hit a certain holiday, where a lot of times in real life, you're probably actually busy on real life holidays. Um, This is something that Stardew Valley does well and right. I understand Animal Crossing's perspective of rewarding players for playing on those particular days. But it can be a little tiresome um, to have to actually plan for that in real life. Um, And especially if you want to play the game in Animal Crossing and you have nothing to do, it's real life time. So it's like, well, I've already shopped today. I've already done my things. I have to wait till actual tomorrow. Guess I'll see you later, Animal Crossing. Oh, man. So, and I haven't played yeah. the newest one, but those times where like the shop would be closed that real life day. And it's like, well, mm-hmm. this whole day it's done. There's a day in Stardew Valley where the shop is closed. And then you just, you're like, okay, well, I'll sell my stuff, quote, tomorrow. But it's not really like I have to go to sleep and play the next day. And that's such a weird mechanic to me to begin with. But it's good that Stardew Valley took that same concept and I think improved on, on that, made it more of a video game. It does. And so now we're going to talk about the two paths. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, price line. There's not, there's not too much of a story per se. Again, like I said, there's different things you can have with different people as you increase your levels to learn more about them or get some conversations. But this is the overall plot idea. There's two paths you can take. But at first, you start with a scene of your grandfather in bed. Uh, So it's in this room, and you're standing in front of your grandfather who lays sick. He presents you with an envelope as you two talk. 
However, he tells you not to open it. After you take the envelope, your grandfather tells you that there will be a day where you will feel crushed by the burden of life and your spirit will fade. When that day comes, that is when you are to open the envelope. After his speech to you, he asks for rest and the screen fades to black. In the game, you learn that your grandfather has passed away. Rip. As, <laughs> as we move on in the scene, your character is presented in a cubicle office space owned by the business known as Jojamart. As you sit at your desk, you look exhausted and remember that the envelope that your grandfather gave you is in a drawer. You open the envelope to find that your grandfather gave you the deed to his land that is located in Stardew Valley. After reading the letter, the scene cuts to a scenic bus ride to Pelican Town where your land awaits. Now, as Derek had mentioned earlier, the Joja Evil Path or the true Gaming Chad Community Center Path. <laughs> It's two options you have. No. Derek, Derek, start us off with the evil one. So the Jojamar plays a very important role within the story behind Stardew Valley. It's similar to your typical market, but it's got a cold, uninviting atmosphere. Morris is the one who manages the mart and handles PR. And you might be wondering who cares about a mart. The problem with Jojamart is that it takes away business from the community of Pelican Town. So you can see where it's evil. True mm -hmm. evil. True evil. The more evil truth to this is that you were working for Joe Jamart. When the game mm -hmm. starts, it's the whole reason you wanted to get away, and then you realize that it is still impeding the citizens of Pelican Town. So as a player, you get the choice. Do you want to continue to support Joe Jamart or not? At the beginning of the game, you're able to go to the Mart, buy a membership, and buying this membership will result in the Joja Mart being able to take over the rundown community center. Taking these actions is known as taking the corporate path of the game, the Forbes path, as I'm mm -hmm. going to call it from now on. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> if you become a member, you pay Morris to complete community development projects. On the other hand, instead of supporting Joja Mart, you can support Pelican Town, and the community by donating to replenish the community center instead. So in, realistically, I view these two things as getting money is easy and simple, mm -hmm. and I'm just going to pay off Joe Jamart, and they're going to complete this community center for me, and it's going to restore the town. Then there's the way that's the more difficult path, in my opinion, the community center path. You want to tell us about that one? The other game path available is supporting the community and merchants of the town by replenishing the community center instead of supporting the corporate business Jojamart. At the beginning of the game, Lewis, the mayor, brings you to the community center and tells you that there is a rat problem. However, you learn that the occupants of the community center are far from rats. The small creatures you find are known as juminos or jujubes, as I call them. <laughs> Taking the community center path, you complete bundles for the Juminos by bringing them different requested items. Once you finish a bundle, they will give you rewards or help you repair parts of the community. Most players enjoy this path of the game more because of the challenges and adventure in completing these bundles. So some stuff is like donate so much stone, so much wood, donate certain sea creatures, donate uh, certain crops or high quality crops. And it allows those little jujubes to come out and open up different areas of this community center. And it starts to get built back and look more wondrous as you continue along with it. And as Derek had said, there's two paths. If you go the Joja path, pretty much wipes out the community center and you just pay money to build a new bridge, to build train stuff, to build bus stops. Whereas with this, it kind of naturally, magically happens by them using their Stardew Valley magic right. to complete these community center bundles to allow it to be open. And it's more difficult because the items that you have to give are seasonal dependent. You can miss yep. certain items. Um, and if you do that, you have to play through to the next season or the next year and mm -hmm. try and achieve those things again. And then there's certain things that are locked, I believe, behind skill levels as well. Yes. So you have to be paying attention to what items you actually need. You have to be making sure, like putting an emphasis on growing a good level 
vegetable or fruit or whatever mm-hmm. it is that you're growing, or you have to make sure you're upgrading your farm in a way that you can produce that specific product. So you have to be a lot more per- particular about what it is that you're doing on the farm or in the game. Whereas with Joe Jamar, you can focus on whatever it is you want to do. Like if it's in the town or something else and you just kind of throw some crops on your farm and water them and then make money and you're done. Yeah. I think that the more rewarding path is the community center path. But as far as starting a new game over, it's probably easier just to do the Joja Mart and move forward in that way. I mean, would you agree with that? Yeah, I definitely like for single player, you can choose really either, in my opinion, if you want the challenge or if you want to kind of jump into seeing those new areas, if you haven't seen them before. Multiplayer wise, though, I definitely like the community center because you have four different people that can be working on this. Like when you were doing crops and I was in the mine getting very specific things for it, it sped it along, obviously double timed it, but it was also just rewarding to have something to do besides just sit there and grow stuff or go get gems to sell and to maximize that. It, it, it gives you both options and I'm glad that it does because again, he wanted to spark talk, wanted to spark, you know, a whole conversation around these things. You know, Joe Jamar, aka pretty much Amazon coming in, taking over these areas versus having someone come in and fix the community center and donate their time and money to it instead of a corporation kind of bulldozing it, putting up a nice Joe Jamart park yeah. and calling it a day. Their kind of version the of what a good community center is supposed to be or whatever, you know. Exactly. No charm. Exactly. So in the multiplayer that you were talking about, you can play from one player all the way up to four. Mm -hmm. You can join the same world through split screen over LAN or by IP address. And multiplayer is available on the PC and console versions, but unfortunately not on mobile or the PS Vita. But still a lot of options for that. Oh, yeah. The player who creates the world is the host and the other players are farm hands. The host has the save file on their system and can play it in both multiplayer and single player mode. But if the host isn't online or the farm isn't currently open to other players, the farm hands cannot access the world or their characters in that world. And farm ownership can't be transferred to farm hands without modding. And so when you and I were playing in the height of the pandemic, I had to have you there. But Mm -hmm. to be honest, like it's two totally different experiences. Yes. I I had my single player farm and I had the farm with you. I was never going to go into that farm without you and feel like, we were playing it the same way. So to me, it, exactly. it works out really yeah. well. Yeah, totally. And so a world can be created specifically for the multiplayer, or it could be converted from a single player to a multiplayer. And like we said, it's mostly identical, uh, but there are certain things about the multiplayer mode that are specific to multiplayer mode. Yeah. So the first was just simply a map four corners map. Uh, it was designed with multiplayer mode in mind. Each quadrant of the map features a small area for perks from some of the farm maps to manifest, as well as a tiny pond in each quadrant so that you can get water for your watering can and not feeling like I have to run all the way over to Derek's farm on the east to get water, run all the way back. So it made it kind of equal uh, for people to use it. And then it also became a single player map as well if you wanted to kind of have those abilities all around there. Then we also had the idea of cabins. So you have like your grandfather's house that is there. Then there was additional cabins that you can build. And the farm can contain up to three cabins. For each cabin built, one player can join the farm. If the farm starts with fewer than three cabins, including the one from the save file, Robin, who is another person in town who works at like the lumber yard or is basically the carpenter, can build you three additional cabins, totaling 100 gold each. And it's instantaneous, so it's not like Animal Crossing. We don't have to wait till tomorrow for your cabin to be built. We just slap that thing on the ground, and then you jump in and play. The host player can also demolish a cabin at any time, and demolishing that cabin removes the occupant from the game and places their inventory in a chest near where the cabin was. A cabin can be upgraded at the carpenter's shop by the farmhand who occupies it, but not by the host or any other player. The interior layout of an upgraded cabin is identical to the interior of an upgraded farmhouse. As with the farmhouse, the physical footprint of the cabin does not change when upgraded. It just gets that Doctor Who kind of 
S bigger <laughs> on the inside than it is on the outside. Which uh, that's the way to do it because mm-hmm. especially when you pick the farms that don't have a lot of farmland on them, yep. it's important to have as much space as possible. So we also have profit margins when creating a new multiplayer save a profit margin of 25, 50, 75 percent or the default 100 percent can be chosen. Opting to lower the profit margin helps rebalance the economy in multiplayer mode by reducing the gold obtained when selling most items, including crops, forage, minerals, and cooked foods, to account for the increased productivity from the increased number of active players. For example, at 25% profit margin, wheat is sold for 6 gold instead of 25. Purchase prices for seeds at Pierre's General Store and purchase prices for grass, starter, sugar, wheat, flour, and rice at Joja Mart are scaled with a profit margin set. Prices for other items, including blacksmith and fish shop items, buildings and tool upgrades, and quest gold rewards are not affected. Lowering the profit margin makes gold much harder to come by in the early game. Progressing in all skills evenly, crafting items, and completing help-wanted quests become far more important. For example, Willy still sells crab pots for 1,500 gold despite the reduced income, so mining iron and crafting crab pots may be the smarter decision. Mm -hmm. Note that there is no profit margin option when creating a single player save. However, it is possible to have a single player save with a chosen profit margin by creating a multiplayer save and playing solo. You could choose co-op in the main menu instead of new and then load it in single player after the save file is created. So you can sort of have this work around to create your own difficulty level. And it makes sense, right? Like it's way easier yep. when we were playing together to have me working the farm and fishing and you going into the mines. We were getting all the resources we needed and we were getting the money that we needed. Mm-hmm. And, and granted, like you are, you know, double buying like two backpacks, multiple tools we'll have to upgrade, but it does make it feel a lot more. And I don't want to ever say grindy. It never felt grindy but it makes it more realistic in like curbing those expectations of what we're going to make in spring for the first time, knowing that we're not going to maximize, get all the backpack slots, get all the stuff like in the first two weeks, instead of it taking kind of like a whole season to start to work towards that. Personally, I did like the idea that it was easier for us to work together. I, to me, that sort of, Oh yeah. That was the fun in that. Yeah. We were going to be more productive faster. We were going to, Mm-hmm. be able to achieve things that I wasn't going to be able to achieve on my own in the single player. Like that's why I had a single player campaign as well. But maybe if you've started a new farm multiple times and you're just looking for a little bit more of a challenge, then you have that option available for you. Yeah. So if you're looking out there and you want to make uh, life hell, 25% it, baby. <laughs> Are you a masochist? 25% it. <laughs> well, Concerned Ape has made it possible for you to still enjoy Stardew Valley. And are you a masochist? Because marriage is an option in the game. (laughs) Oh, my God. Hopefully my wife does not listen to this. So going on to the next transition, because this is the episode of transitions, (laughs) players can marry an NPC, which works the same way as single player. Each NPC can only be married by one player at a time, and children are added to the married player's home. Players can marry other players by giving them a wedding ring. Married players get a star drop in a purple gift box next to their home beds after the wedding. A home is eligible for children if it's owned by one of the married players, has the kids' room upgrade, doesn't already have two children, and both players are sleeping in its bed. The game will randomly let one player choose to propose having children to the other. And if accepted, the child will be added to the home that both players are sleeping in, else the other player's home or whatever the current home that they're in. Did we get married? In this game, we did not. We're just we're just two hardworking individuals who just you know we we we're never home on time. You stayed out too late. Mm, yeah, it was just it was difficult. I yes, I cannot be trusted to be home on time <laughs> for sure. I I I thought that maybe we talked about it for the <laughs> only for the reason that it was like my cabin was slightly farther away than the house so it was like it would be really great if i could just go into the house and then sleep like we were down to the steps (laughs) we were going forbes level efficiencies and (laughs) but we didn't yeah apparently we didn't you know 
We, we need to get back to it. We need to get back to our lives, back on the farm, and, and see if we can save those steps. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's talk about the music. Obviously mm-hmm, a mm-hmm. great soundtrack for this game. The Stardew Valley original soundtrack was composed by Eric Barone, Concerned Ape, as he is better known. And he also worked on all the sound effects. Barone never had to set aside the time to write the music as he often worked on it as a break from the coding, artwork, and storyline creation. And it never felt like a chore to him, enjoying it so much that more music was created than was actually needed. The entire soundtrack would be composed through the digital audio workstation Propellerhead Reason, with Barone writing almost exclusively with a mouse rather than a MIDI controller. Because of this, the music has natural and precise symmetry to it. Most of the sounds were created from scratch, with the majority being taken from synthesizers, which were also used for the development of the game's sound effects. Barone would take inspiration from much of Nintendo's music, wanting the game to have distinct feelings associated with what was happening within the story. Using the analogy of opening a book, Barone made the soundtrack's overture sound wide and open, like the beginning of the game with the later track sounding more in-depth as the story progresses. However, the main theme would still be passed around throughout many different tracks in order to bring cohesion to the soundtrack. And so going back a little bit where he's plugging things in with the mouse, basically, Mm -hmm. like, if if this digital audio workspace, a DAW, works anything like the one that I use, you can pick an instrument, and then you can just click within basically little sections that are determined by the beats per minute that you want a song to be, as well as the time signature. And you are able to just program in different notes and sounds. It's set up like a keyboard almost, where if I want a higher pitch, I click up higher. If I want a lower pitch, I click down lower. And then you're able to just sort of move those things from left to right in order to make them sound in time. And then you can also extend them so that they sound out longer or fit within uh, that certain time signature. So you can absolutely make an entire soundtrack that way. I think it is a lot more of a painstakingly technical process to do it that way rather than just playing it on a keyboard if you have that ability. But if you don't have that ability Mm -hmm. or you want something to sound more natural and you're not able to do that on the keyboard that functionality is a a great tool to use for sure no that makes sense and especially if you're not talented with it and you just you just know 8-bit and you know how it is but you're like i have no experience on the keys i'm not really 100 percent how this would work but you know i know how to click some stuff i played some uh mario music maker way back when on the uh, super (laughs) nintendo i know what i'm doing right and if you uh listen to that little ad that we've got at the beginning of these episodes in the middle of these episodes if you're listening to it and that ad is still running um that's basically more or less what i did i played it on a keyboard and then any little mistakes i'm not really a keyboard player any little mistakes i'm able to just slide those left or right or extend them or Mm -hmm. whatever i want to do so you can create some really technically sound in time music by utilizing tools like that awesome when it came to the soundtrack's overall texture barone wanted each season to feel as lifelike as possible the sitar and smaller stringed instruments were used to bring an exotic and tropical feel for the summer season indicating the lush growth of nature bassoons and marimbas generated an ethereal and mysterious texture for the fall indicating the feelings of mystery and melancholy A minimalist approach was used for the winter, with cold-sounding instruments like synthesizers, piano, and bells giving the impression of the dead plants and the cold air. The toughest to compose, according to Barone, was the spring, due to it being the only season that doesn't have a distinct feeling. Going with his gut, Barone went for the most natural feeling he could, using flutes, xylophones, and other light and airy instruments to convey the sprite-like atmosphere of new life. And I think that's a good gut feeling Mm -hmm. because there's an airiness to spring for sure, especially after the cold winter months where not a lot is happening. Yeah, there is. There's new growth, new life, dewiness. People are going out and about. It feels green again. And and I think that works because the other three, like he said, are, are somewhat distinct musically. I don't know why we all feel that way, but those instruments 
fit that feeling of that time. And I think it worked really well the way he did that. And spring, yeah, spring is just always like light wind or light brass instruments coming together, you know, maybe a couple strings, a light percussion, but that's about it because it is this renewal, this like breath of fresh air idea. And it worked. It worked really well with what he could do with it. And you felt it. It felt like that. Very much how like I was compared a lot to the compositions in Legend of Zelda in the various places you go to, whether it's a temple or whether it's like one of the areas and you go to the mountain where you've got flames and boulders coming down or you're in a serene water area or you're by the Deku tree. Like it all fits the feelings of those elements. Like when you walk into the, uh, the fairy fountain areas and now all of a sudden mm-hmm. it is a harp. Yes. Or yeah, you're, you're in that, the death mountain area and it's a lot of drums and like deep sounding, you know, like Gregorian type of uh, deep chorus sound and toughness Mm -hmm. and yeah i mean people even if you're not a a musician or you're not passionate about music at all i think that you can still feel the effects of those those different musical choices and for him to use this in a daw there's a lot of options available for him at this point so to to have that vision and to be able to make sure that he's designing music that fits those different seasons makes the game way more interesting. Yeah. One unique feature of the game is choosing to be friends with the character Sam, the musician. If the player chooses to do so, he asks what kind of musical style the player likes and then goes on to perform that music with original lyrics tailored to the player in a virtual concert with his band. During an interview with the sound test on YouTube, Barone expressed that the idea of a tailored music to the player was one of the earliest ideas he came up with when brainstorming the game. So it's sort of like your KK slider moment, but it's personalized Mm -hmm. to you. Yeah. And and it's just interesting. Again, building those story elements that Sam's a musician, he's going to do his custom tailored concert. It's those little interwoven story moments that are so much fun. The Stardew Valley original soundtrack was released on November 7th, 2015 through Barone's Bandcamp, as well as most virtual music streaming platforms. It contains 70 tracks for a total of 123 minutes, with more tracks being added whenever there is an update. The Stardew Valley Complete Vinyl Soundtrack box set is available, if you're lucky, at Fangamer.com, which includes the complete Stardew Valley soundtrack across four beautiful colored LPs, carefully mastered just for vinyl, with lots and lots of brand new art by Carrie Fry, the artist behind the Stardew Valley guidebook, and four separate vinyl collected in one sturdy slipcase. Each Stardew Valley vinyl box set includes an instant digital download of the complete version 1.5, which was the update in December of 2020, and that soundtrack is in MP3, WAV, or a FLAC file. Now, Derek, I I might have to go on record. I believe this is an FTF first. I do own that box set. Oh, yeah. Here we go. You, you managed so, uh, to get so that one. Managed to get that one. So if you're tying it up at home, because I know everyone is, that's a win for Alex, not a win for the man. Did you... Who uh, holds it away from me. So you, you were able to get this one not secondhand. This was... Uh, correct. Correct. So Fan Gamer, uh, they're an amazing company that produces a lot of indie, um, not produced stuff anymore, and they'll get the licenses for that. So they have like Ori and the Will of the Wisp, uh, Stardew Valley, Delta Rune, all these smaller indie stuff, and they will create the physical, very much like how you'd buy a collector's edition. Sure. They create that for these smaller companies. And so they do repressings a lot. If it's insanely popular, like Banjo Kazooie, they have one. And then for the Stardew Valley one, I got very lucky with a repress because I think it was $65 or $85 I paid Ooh. for the four records. And they're going for a couple hundred on eBay and, and other places. And then I also have a slip mat that goes on your record player. That's a Stardew Valley um, smorgasbord of characters and other stuff. That oh, that's cool. I got with it as well. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's really cool. I've got, um, I think I just have one record that came with an additional slip mat, but those are, those are really interesting. I do enjoy those. Yeah, there's, there's so much fun to have, and it's just a cool little piece whenever you have your record closed. And like, I have a um, jewel case on top so you can see through it. Yeah. And uh, so it's just cool to have that there. Yeah. So fun sure. stuff. So look. Chalk one up for a win. What uh, what color is the vinyl? Is it just black? 
Uh, no, uh, each color represents a season. So it's like pink, oh. blue, green, and yellow, and they all match their slip sleeves. That's cool. Um, are they? It's yes. just a solid color, or is it like a just a solid color? So, so it's not a marbling or anything. It's just a solid uh, pastel tone. Nice uh, that goes with each of them. Yes, yeah, individual with it. The box is super well constructed. Has original art all through the box. All of the sleeves have uh, the Juminos on them, doing various little like mischievous things for each season, as well as all the fruits and veggies for each season being interwoven into the art. That's super cool. Yeah, yeah. You'll it's, have to really you'll have cool. to take some pictures and and share that. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna slap it in the, the the Discord, slap it on the Insta. You guys will see it. Oh yeah, some good stuff. Cool. Oh yeah. All right, so let's jump over to the releases, the initial one, and various others that we had. So in April of 2015, Barone announced he intended to release the game only once he felt it was feature complete, refusing to put the game onto any early access program or accept any presale payments. The game was released for Microsoft Windows on February 26, 2016, and following its release, Barone continued to work on the game, taking feedback from the community and patching bugs, and stated plans to add in additional features on later dates. Barone anticipated adding in more endgame content, as well as ports for other platforms. Barone had stated that he initially planned a four-player cooperative mode to be released at the game's launch, and in this mode, you would all share the same farm, these different tasks, very much like we've been talking about. He really wanted that to be a part of it. It was added in late 2017 for the Windows version, but was still in works, you know, trying to work the network code until early 2018. The multiplayer beta for Windows released in April of 2018 and officially launched August 1st of 2018, with December of 2018 being the release for the Nintendo Switch. So definitely something he wanted at the start, had some works with it and then made its way later down the road. Now, mobile versions for iOS and Android were developed with the help of the secret police, with the iOS version being released on October 24th, 2018, and the Android version being released March 14th, 2019. Both versions include the ability for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux users to transfer progress to their device, which is fantastic and kind of rarely seen in that area. In 2018, Barone stated his desire to assemble a team of developers to help continue further development of the game. And by 2019, all versions of the game, except on mobile, were self-published by Barone. Stardew Valley has also seen an active modding community with players adding various new features to the game. And oddly enough, in December of 2019, Stardew Valley was added to the Tesla Arcade, a Linux-based video game service incorporated within most models of Tesla today mm, that's interesting so, so you could play some stardew on your tesla yeah i don't know why people play games in their tesla it doesn't seem like a great environment for it but hey no you do you no it doesn't if anything bring your switch i guess and then play it on that yeah. but you mm -hmm. know so we've talked about it a little bit we'll talk about it a little bit more just working with chucklefish in may 2016 barone announced that the publisher chucklefish would help with non-english localizations Mac OS, Linux, and console ports, and the technical aspects required for online cooperative play, allowing him to focus solely on the first major content update. The Mac OS and Linux ports were released on July 29, 2016, and ports for the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One were announced at E3 2016 in June. At the same event, Barone stated that a port for the Wii U was also to be released, although that version was later canceled in favor of a version for the Nintendo Switch. The PS4 and Xbox One versions were released respectively on December 13th and 14th, 2016, and the Switch version, ported by Sickhead Games, was released on October 5th, 2017. In early 2017, Barone stated his intentions for the possibility of a PlayStation Vita port, which was later confirmed and released on May 22nd, 2018, a collector's edition released at the same time and included a physical map of the game's world, a download code for the soundtrack, and a guidebook. And in late 2018, Barone announced that he would begin self-publishing the PC, Xbox, PS4, and Vita ports himself, while Chucklefish remained as publishers for the Switch and mobile versions of the game. In October 2019, Barone took over self-publishing duties for the Switch port, in October 2021, Barone began self-publishing the iOS port as well. So a lot of responsibilities 
Yes. So a lot to take over, but very good. Switching off of that C sharp through Microsoft and going through a whole nother life cycle, basically, for the game and making sure that it can kind of run all these. And it made sense. One, the moolah he's making. Two, getting help from some other people to kind of self-publish all of this, have full creative and publishing control over it versus trying to go through. And again, there was never anything that indicated sourness between any relationships. I think it's just owning your own thing, but also the ease of being able to push out updates whenever you want, not having to go through you know, a, a partner publisher to get stuff pushed out. You control all of it in the end. Well, and they definitely benefited from those. Obviously, at the height of those releases, that's going to be where you benefit the most just because that's when the, the height of interest is going to be. And Mm -hmm. so now, obviously, there will be these small little maybe new buyers or new users that crop up again whenever he does these updates. But for the most part, I think the the money train is it's left the station. Yeah. And it's it's still just allowing him to work on new projects, which we are coming up to now as we start to wrap our coverage of Stardew Valley. And so Stardew Valley's original release on the PC received an 89 on Metacritic with its additional releases never falling below an 86. Jesse Signal, writing for the Boston Globe, wrote that the game was, quote, utterly compelling, lovingly crafted, and provided players with numerous varieties of activities to do without falling into a cycle of repetitive activities, a la very much like Animal Crossing. Elise Favis of Game Informer found that watching her autistic brother play Stardew Valley helped her understand his condition better, as the game provides enough structure of present events with enough of a view of future events to allow her brother to enjoy the game. And I've heard that a lot for the autistic community and special needs community, this, along with Minecraft and Terraria, that do present a challenge, but presented in such a way that allows so many people the access to play it is amazing. And it allows people to get that escapism that video games want to give that people may not have in other games. Whether it's a control scheme, whether it's fast paced, whatever it is, it definitely allows for it. Stardew Valley sold over 400,000 copies across Steam and GOG.com in two weeks and more than a million within two months. Valve reported that Stardew Valley was in the top 24 revenue-generating games on Steam during 2016. Journalists noted that the gaming community had shown support for Barone for the game. While there had been some players who obtained the game illegally, these players were impressed with the game and stated they planned to purchase the game, while other players made offers to help pay for those who could not afford it, which is huge for indie devs. And indie devs say it all the time. They're like, if you cannot afford my game, pirate it. Please don't bite on a gray market. Just pirate it. And if you like it and you can afford it later, I'd love for you to purchase it. If not, I just want you to play my title. And that's that's huge. If you pirate it and you're like, you know what? I actually really do like this and want to support them. I'm actually going to pay for it is, is a really big step. Well, and yeah, because word of mouth is massive for indie devs they don't have the budgets Mm -hmm. to market these games the same way that other developers and publishers do so just having more of an audience is a big deal for them and and the community as well that that plays that if you like the game or you pirated it and you go on twitch maybe you're more likely to watch someone else play stardew so there's there's sort of like an economy even within that where, mm-hmm. yeah, pirating games, I think most people would prefer that you bought their game, but sure, someone like Concerned Ape understands maybe that's not always realistic. And he's done his best to make that game available on as many platforms as possible, which I know is a big motivating factor for people that pirate games if they can't get it through normal means. And so not only is he doing that, but he's also doing things to make sure that the community has that option available for them. If, you know, if they're on Mac, if they're on mobile only, or they're on the switch or the Xbox or the PlayStation or whatever it is, or if they prefer retail versions, you know, physical Mm -hmm. copies, he's done a lot 
that I think the community asks for, it really goes back to him reading those Reddit comments and forum comments and actually listening to them. Yeah. And and having that passion, as you had stated earlier, having that true passion in this project that was supposed to just be an exercise to get a job turned out to be the perfect job. <laughs> I don't have to work ever again. I'm still gonna. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. It's, and that's the thing is like being like, oh, I worked eight to nine hours. I'm going to go do some music as well. And you know what? I love it. Yeah. Like I love what I'm doing and now I'm making a lot of money doing it and I get to keep doing more fun things like this. Yeah. I've, I've found it. I'm very envious of his work ethic just to, mm-hmm. because you could say that and it sounds great in theory to be like, yeah, I'm going to code all day and then I'm going to go and make music and that's going to be my break. But at a certain point, just like the mental exhaustion is going to get oh, to yeah. most people. So um, really admirable that he's able to mm-hmm. do that. By the end of 2017, Stardew Valley had sold more than 3.5 million copies across all platforms. The game was also the most downloaded on the Nintendo Switch for 2017, despite only being released in October of that year. It is estimated that the game's first three weeks on the Apple App Store it had earned more than $1 million in revenue. By January 2020, Stardew Valley had sold over 10 million copies across all platforms, with that figure rising to 15 million by September 2021. Yasuhiro Wada, the creator of the Harvest Moon series that Stardew Valley was inspired by, stated that he was very happy with the game, as it has shown to him that Harvest Moon was not a forgotten series and continued in spirit. He also stated that the approach taken by Barone with Stardew Valley was able to retain the freedom that he had wanted to keep in the Harvest Moon series that had been lost in the later games, with more focus on animation and graphics. Gamasutra named Barone one of the top 10 developers for 2016, identifying that he had single-handedly developed something that breathed new life into a genre, otherwise dominated by the Harvest Moon series. In 2017, Forbes named Barone one of their 30 under 30 people, to watch in the area of video games by citing his commitment towards making Stardew Valley. Many media outlets praised Stardew Valley for its LGBTQ plus options and representation. And that was one thing that I know Barona consulted on and that a lot of people were pleasantly surprised by. Again, a lot of us don't, I'm not going to don't need, we just don't experience that representation. We just have, we play the game, we're good to go. And for people who um, are of the LGBTQ plus community to be able to experience that is, is really cool. And it just keeps bringing new life into games that just allow for kind of whatever people want to do. Yeah. And so to wrap this up, I had mentioned it a couple of times, but Barone is working on a new project called Haunted Chocolatier, which was announced on October 8th, 2021, with a YouTube video showing some early gameplay of his project. On hauntedchocolatier.net, Barone documents his journey on creating his new game through blog posts and game updates. His first post, released the same time as the trailer, states, quote, Why chocolate? I'm not sure. It just kind of came to me. I think sometimes the best ideas just appear in a flash instead of being cleverly thought out. That's how I like to work anyway. What's important is the execution. And after 10 years of practice, I feel more confident than ever in being able to bring an idea to life. Regardless, I think a lot of people like chocolate. In Stardew Valley, the focus was more humble. Live off the land, growing food, and connecting to the people and nature around you. However, with my next game, I want to explore more fantastical possibilities. Experiences that take you beyond the ordinary. That's where magical haunted ghost chocolate comes in. Chocolate represents that which is delightful. The haunted castle represents the allure of the unknown. The ghosts represent the imprint of the past. All of these things are important. However, don't think for a moment that because this game features ghosts in a haunted castle, it is evil or a negative game. On the contrary, I intend for this to be positive, uplifting, and life-affirming. However, if Stardew Valley mostly channeled the energy of the sun, Haunted Chocolatier channels the energy of the moon. Both are vital. More important than all of that, I just want to make a fun game. Now, you might be scratching your head, wondering exactly what type of game this is. I'm not sure how best to describe it. It's evolving organically as I develop it, so I'm not sure where it will go. But at its core, the gameplay loop involves gathering ingredients, making chocolate, and running a chocolate shop. 
Of course, there's a lot more to the game than that, but I don't want to get too deep into it at this early stage, probably because I don't want to be tied down to any particular concept of what the game is. So far, I've been having fun working on this game. There are so many possibilities. With Stardew Valley, I felt somewhat constrained because I was working within an established tradition. I don't regret that at all, but there's always been a part of me that wanted to go, quote, unleashed. I believe this will be a good opportunity, but I haven't even gotten to the good stuff yet. I've been mostly working on the meat and potatoes of the game so far, but what really brings a game to life is the spice, the sauce, and I haven't really gotten to the sauce yet. That's coming. So it, it's very exciting to see a developer who tried out this side experiment to get a job because they couldn't really fall in love with it and fall in love with it so much. They continue to do free updates for years and they're now doing another project that they have fallen in love with again, being able to do some of the stuff that they necessarily couldn't do in Stardew that was grounded in a reality of real world things, a little mysticism, but be able to change it up in this new one. I am extremely excited to see what this brings and to see just so much come out of a new IP from a single man. Yeah, when he says that he is looking to do something that's unleashed, I'm really curious where his head is at because I mm -hmm. Stardew Valley is a game where there's magic, there's little juminos, there's a wizard, there's a mine shaft where you fight like yeah. the undead and all kinds of other crazy things so there's already that mysticism within stardew like he said but obviously there's going to be something just totally unhinged about this and maybe all he really means is that in stardew valley it sort of operates within our version of the world right where yeah you you wake up early in the morning go to sleep not too late or it messes you up little things like that like a, a normal lifestyle there's events in the small towns things like that mm -hmm. so maybe we'll see something more I, I can only speculate but obviously when he sets out to make a new game he really gives it everything that he has and so i'm sure regardless of whatever the end result is and what type of game it is, it's going to be a very good, well-thought-out, detailed game with a lot of longevity. Yes. And that's what's so very exciting. And now taking all of his different ports under his own wing, self-publishing, having all the rights and all this money flowing in where it's not... That doesn't seem like it'll ever be an issue in this. We're having AAA titles that are coming out broken right now that are just, you know, a money grab. And it seems so much more like this, especially with indie devs and a single dev, that we're going to get so much more of that passion out of it again. And uh, always a tinge of feel of Stardew. I don't think we'll ever get away from that. But a whole new feeling of a new concept that's going to be created is going to be very exciting. Yeah, and especially with... I mean, it's so interesting because we can look back to when the video game industry just started to shift and these AAA games mm -hmm. just became these big, big money makers. And what started out for most of the games that we've covered, there were always these little passion projects that just became something so much bigger, sometimes by accident, sometimes on purpose. But now that they've already established themselves in that realm, they don't get necessarily that same freedom that same level of passion. They're constrained. Yeah. And so we see developers like Concerned Ape, and we're able to see where that level of passion within gaming can still exist and still be successful and can still make money and be available and, and fun for a lot of people who like all different genres of video games. So I really like this success story. I think that it's really interesting. My review for this game is, I'm going to go back to back 10 out of 10. Okay. I don't have any complaints about Stardew Valley. I really don't. I think that the world that he built is very, very interesting. I love the top-down perspective. What a throwback for me. Just that, that top-down, sort of left-right, up-down sort of feel um, just reminds me of the games that I used to play a lot when I was a kid. I think that the music is fantastic. I love it. Obviously, a lot of thought put into that. And 
it really is a painstaking process to go in and click with a mouse one by one. I know that it sounds simple and easy probably to a lot of people, but it's really annoying to do. It's really, really hard to do. So to be able to put that meticulous process um, into this game, I think was a, a massive, massive success and a good addition. I think that the expanse of this game is incredible. I mean, the world mm-hmm. is both small and big at the same time, where you you feel connected to everything and you can sort of tell that, yeah, there's like a certain pathway that you have to take to get into the town so your farm can be isolated. And then there's these little trips that you can take to different parts of the world. And you sort of have everything all in one place. You can have the woods and you can have rivers and you can have the beach and you can have the town and you can have like the, the little getaway spa area and you can have the mine. And there's just so many things to do. And regardless of what kind of player you want to be, that option is very likely available for you. And if you want to be like the Forbes guy that just runs a very tight knit farm, you can do that. Or if you want to be like his mm-hmm. daughter and just work on the relationships within the game, you can do that too and have friends. So I really do feel like it's about as perfect as a game can get for this genre. 10 out of 10. What about you? I mean, you pretty much hit all the points. The only thing I want to bring up too is I just love how much the game does not hold your hand. You know, there, there there's a, I wouldn't even call it like it's a minor tutorial. It's just quests you do to like plant these parsnips, do this, do this, just to get you started. But after that, it's just some main quest stuff. The mine is just a cutscene that kind of opens. You see some guy working on a thing and you eventually go in and you're like, oh, there's stuff in here I can fight. Oh, I can go down these levels. Like there's just so many things. And I, we haven't hinted at really any spoilers if you haven't played, but there's characters you'll meet that are in secret locations. You know, you get some secret stuff out of certain people. It's so, so cool. So if I had to give it a rating, I would give it, I would have to give it like, there's not a numerical scale to this one, but it's the level of naughtiness that Mayor Lewis presents. Mm. Like, I mean, he is the naughty boy. Purple pants boy. Purple pants boy. Just take it out of, take it out of. Mayor Lewis's salary, and then divide it by his promiscuous attitude percentage. Easy numbers right there on what this game is worth. Oh, Easy. The PAP. The PAP, as they call it, of they, course. They call him the Pap. Pappy. <laughs> call him Pappy, <laughs> yep. Some people do. Old Mayor Pappy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Research for this episode was done by Alex Kendall, Derek Baker, with assistance from Evan Barr. The intro and outro music for this episode was composed and recorded by Evan Barr. And if you haven't yet, check out our new cover art provided by Aaron Shattuck. As always, beautiful people, beautiful people. But we also have our Patreon. Uh, It is the thing that helps support the lifeblood of the podcast, keeps us going, and keeps us doing fun things. Uh, Check out our new D&D sessions coming up as well as some bonus episodes, some bonus content, game nights, shirts, stickers, the works. I want to thank those people today with Sky the Bear, Nick Hyman, Mr. 1898, Mr. Choff, McChief, Grant Dillon, and Climbing Spork. So if you want to hit that tier to get your name read or just see any of the perks that we have, hit it up at patreon.com slash finish the fight. This podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast listening platform. If you haven't yet, please leave us a review. We love hearing from you guys, and it helps us out a lot. And as always, you can catch us over at twitch.tv slash sourman70. That's S-O-U-R-M-A-N-7-0. Or Derek over at twitch.tv slash thebakerman247. That is thebakerman247. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram. We also have a Discord. Alex and I are in there all the time having a lot of fun. That's definitely our most active place. So please feel free to click the link below and join us today. And that has been our coverage of Stardew Valley. Are you a community center Chad or a Joja Mart shill? Let us know. Or if you haven't played it, please check it out. It's a fantastic game. Um, But we will catch you 
on the next episode. As always, I am your host, Alex Kendall. And I'm your host, Eric Baker. And this has been Finish the Fight, a gaming podcast. Mm-hmm.